Thank you so much for tuning in to Morning Markets. We're going to get right to our first guest joining me on the desk because in many ways, we hope he has the answers to a lot of the market questions of the day, namely on rates, namely on inflation, and of course, on economic health. Joining me now in studio, Stephen Polas, former governor of the Bank of Canada and current special advisor to Osler. Thanks for joining me. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. So you always know my first question huh. about rates. Uh, are we done hiking? I think so. On both sides, Canada and U.S.? Yes, I think so. Why? Well, I think uh, when we take account of where inflation came from, good five points of the inflation surge came from outside supply shock issues. That's resolving itself. We're down to what happened from the excess demand perspective, which is around 3%. And the central banks globally actually have put a lot in place to fight that. And most of what the, the effect they will have is still, you know, in the pipeline. Most of it will happen I think over the next 12 months. I think very little of the decline in inflation we've seen so far has anything to do with what the central banks did. So do you think the central banks will start to show some muscle in getting the rate from 3% to 2%, which many have said that's where the hard work is? Yeah, well, that's, I think the muscle has been exerted. Uh, you know, it's hard to calibrate these things exactly, and something could still go wrong. So if something changes, well, then they may have to do more work. But I think a lot of the work has been done, certainly I think all of it. In the next 12 months, we'll tell the tale. We'll see all that happening. Importantly, over the past uh, two years, most of the inflation shock has been supply side. And this is why it's so confusing right now. When the supply side shock happens, it of course reduces activity at the same time that it raises prices. And as it go reverses, it allows prices to come down, but it also increases activity. So your activity measures get clouded by this. Uh, it's very hard to read the real activity as feeding into inflation. And so I guess that helps to explain why the, the specter of another rate hike remains hanging over yes. our head, both in Canada and the Fed, because they don't want those inflation expectations to get out from under them. But you're unencumbered by all of that. So can you tell me in your assessment uh, the risks tilted towards the downside on inflation or the upside? So I think the risks on inflation are tilted to the downside just because of the supply effect that I talked about before. Also, we have, uh, we have a lot of uncertainty about how much of an effect interest rates are having <laughs> on the economy. Uh, and uh, we're in a state where, with especially here in Canada, where debt is much higher than it was last cycle. I expect those implications to be larger than we've experienced in the past. Uh, but of course, most of them are just starting. Mm -hmm. So we have to watch it carefully. I mean, honestly, and we're in the gray zone, okay? People know now that it takes a full year for the central bank actions to affect either the US or Canada, affect the economy. It takes another year after that for that to affect inflation. But it also takes two years for you to stop inflation from falling once it gets going. And so we're in that neutral or gray zone where it's going to be really hard to read and it's very hazardous to make a prediction. Well, then I'm still going to ask you to make them uh, <laughs> because uh, we want to know then if we're done hiking, when's the first cut? Well, uh, for all the reasons I just gave, uh, no one knows that. But I don't really think it matters all that much. It matters to folks on the desk. Feels like it matters in the well, market. Well, if, if, if it matters to folks on a desk or are putting their position against the decision itself, uh, but nobody pays the overnight rate at the central bank. Uh, what matters more is the rates that people pay, and they're headed down already. Now, the the data on inflation will not go in a straight line. Okay, therefore, the data from the bond market will no, no, not go in a straight line, and the bond market usually overreacts to new data. And I think that pattern would continue. So watch for volatility, but I think that's your trend over the next 12 months. So inflation coming down, maybe rates easing a little bit, but a lot of that work has already happened in the bond market. That's right. So as investors kind of cheerlead that part of it, the other side of the coin is why are rates coming down? A recession, an economic slowdown. Mm -hmm. um, how bad do you think the slowdown is going to be in Canada? The consensus is it's going to be worse in Canada than in the U.S. So I agree with that consensus. Uh, we definitely have a rougher ride for, can <coughs> for Canadian households than we have for U.S. households. And that's the key to that uh, inference. Uh, we also have a lot going on for companies, right? So we have a lot of debt in our companies, and as they roll over, they're also finding that same squeeze. So as we go forward, I think uh, we, we, we are on that sort of cusp of 
you know, recession. We're in recession-like conditions. But, but, you know, on an aggregate, it may end up looking okay. I think really what it's like the economy, parts of the economy have their head in the freezer, their, their feet in the oven. It's like it's hot and it's cold at the same time. So I, you're kind of a parachute board member, right, at Osler? You, yeah. you go into these board meetings. They ask you probably the same questions I'm asking you. Yes, they do. But what's the pulse right now um, when you speak to these executives? Are they cautious? Are they optimistic? Are they hesitant to spend on new projects, new initiatives? I would say on average, they're cautious. They're worried about uh, the things we just mentioned, how, how bad of a downturn might be in store for us. But on business spending, I think they're, they're doing it because they're really looking for cost savings, this environment. And the primary channel for this is digitization of either the whole business or aspects of the business. And interestingly, none of that really needs an investment. It's usually just a, a, a you know a line on your on your expenditure page, right? It's going to show that you're doing software as a service, throwing stuff on the cloud, maybe uh, offloading some of that back office thing, and costs go down. And so I think that's productivity, right? It'll show up a couple of years from now. We need in this country. We definitely need, but the thing is, it may not come from machinery in that traditional sense. It just it doesn't actually show up in the usual way. You're somebody who, while you were governor, and, and especially now in your role, you had the pulse on industry. Uh, certainly in, in your previous role before the Bank of Canada, the manufacturing sector, um, you took decisive action when there was a plunge in oil prices because mm -hmm. you were so um, in touch with the energy sector and you knew what that plunge was going to mean. Where are the pain points in the economy right now? Are there specific sectors that you can call out that are hurting, or is it kind of a... A general malaise. I, th I think it's fairly general, Amber. I think anybody with a, with a debt layer, you know, before before they were following a debt metric, debt to EBITDA, that's our that's our commitment, that's our max. Well, debt service to EBITDA may be the relevant measure now because debt service has gone up for every unit of debt. And I think some are discovering that that's more pressure than they anticipated, right? Bond markets have deteriorated more than they would have expected. So I think there, there's that as an issue. The, of course, the energy sector continues to be a pain point, and that's part of your theme today. I understand that. But more to the point, I mean, we, we take so long to do anything and we take longer than in the United States. Frankly, I think this is our biggest missing productivity, that time is money, still is, right? And if we take twice as long to do something in the energy sector than they do in the United States, our productivity will lag them all the time. And that's low hanging fruit, if you ask me. Well, except at the central bank. And Bank of Canada tends to do things first for the monetary, <laughs> at least recently, right? Act first on, on both the upside and the downside. Well, that's true. And maybe because the data spoke more loudly at the time, certainly a big difference between the two fiscal policies yes. makes a difference in how those readings came through. And that's what I was going to ask you next. There are still complaints in this country about fiscal, even though it's not perhaps as, as uh, big as it is south of the border, that that's complicating the inflation picture. And Tiff yeah. Macklem, I would say, came very as close as he has to kind of admonishing the fiscal side as a culprit for, for inflation. Can you maybe speak a little louder to that point? Well, there's no question that in uh, 22, in 2022, I think, uh, there was a big opportunity to rein in the fiscal side uh, and put some more money in the bank for the next time we have a major crisis to solve. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, so we, we were like really stimulating the economy at a time when it did not need it. Uh, so that was a missed opportunity. Now that we're into a more recession-like kind of setting, a very, very slow growth, if any, and none per capita, that's less clear, you know, that, the, that, the, that, that's, that that's the problem, okay? Uh, or adding to the inflation pressure. I think that horse has left the barn. But anyway, uh, well, for sure it did. It did add to the inflation yeah. issue uh, as, as it was unfolding, yes. You have talked about this in your book, and it's certainly a big topic um, now, is immigration. Yeah. And what is the wild card that immigration brings to the table? Well, immigration is absolutely crucial for us. Uh, we aren't uh, producing any growth in the workforce from our domestic population. Therefore, all the growth in our workforce will come from immigration. Now, whether 
too much immigration is a problem or too little, that's a, a separate debate. But you actually need some to have the key ingredient to economic growth, uh, and that's uh, labor force growth. All right, net. So with that as, as the beginning, well, we say, well, we really pumped it up, of course, you know, post-pandemic. Uh, and of course, housing became uh, an issue. You, as an economist, like five years ago or three years ago, we thought, well, we'll just build as many dwellings as are needed as time goes on, and we clearly do not. And that's become one of a key inflation constriction or pain point. Um, one of the things I think we could have done, and we still could, is tackle the student housing issue more directly, mm. uh, because they're a really big part of this. <clears throat> it's a great source of, of new em immigrants, you know, very well qualified, et cetera. And so uh, well, what we can do is build lots of housing because students don't use a lot of space, right? You now, student housing is quite, quite compact. Yes. But a lot of more are units per, per floor, so let's, uh, let's say, or per square feet. So I think that's a sort of quick hit that one could consider. And then, of course, that would mean that you would preserve that very precious channel of very high quality immigrants, folks that come here for four years, fall in love with Canada, want to stay, and have got great qualifications from our own universities, what could be better? How do you um, guess that the central bank is thinking about housing right now? Because that's kind of a complicating factor. Yeah. It always seems, you know, because it's so hard to address on the supply side, it's waiting to reaccelerate for any sign to reaccelerate. I understand. I mean, people uh, maybe forget that a house or a, or a condo is just a 50 year bond that you can live in. Yeah. So they weren't surprised when bonds went down, when our rates went up, and now bonds are recovering. Well, so housing's going to do the same thing. And as primarily, as, it's an asset as opposed to a place to live. Uh, I think the bigger question is around the rental side, because that's, of course, okay. the immigration pressures are strongest uh, there. Uh, in due course, I suppose this will work itself out, but we, we obviously have issues on the, on the structure of the housing market. In terms of mixing that up with affordability and accessibility, I think that's where we kind of get to clouding the situation too mm. much. That's more about financial intermediation falling short, I think, of a very complex uh, problem.